Last year, TVO brought you a series of shorts called Main Street, Ontario. This 10-part video series is a slice of a larger Canada-wide project called Tale of a Town, Canada, exploring life in cities and towns through the stories that make them unique. Before we introduce you to its creators, here's a sneak peek. All the action was downtown. The downtown was so alive. There were so many people. Everybody on the main street knew one another. I remember the merchants hosing down their sidewalks, cranking up their awnings. It was bustling. The street had life to it. James Street was La Piazza for the Italian men to walk up and down and uh, have discourses. Uh, uh, this was Little Italy. I grew up with three sisters, and we all lived above the store, my grandparents, my mother, father, my three sisters, myself, and one bathroom. <laughs> so, but we made do. On the corner of Murray and James was Corsini's grocery store. I mean, that was a landmark. I remember a Corsini, very specialized in Italian food. Parmigiano, Romano, uh, Pecorino. Our olives came in uh, like wine barrels. It was packed. James was hit really hard by the recession of the 90s. Businesses were closing. The affluent Italian and Portuguese families were moving to the suburbs. It took away a lot of the energy. All of a sudden, the piazza-like atmosphere of James Street no longer existed here. Many of the buildings were closed down, windows were boarded up. I saw the street go from that very vibrant, the center of the city, to dormant. A lot of people at that time would never even consider coming down uh, to James Street North because why? Why would they do that? It started with the art scene. It started with the gallery called The Hammer, which was on James North. We were the oddballs out on the street. We happened to inhabit a couple of spots. There was like Loose Cannon. Bryce at You Me. Sublimatus. The Hamilton Artist Inc. folks. The Blue Angel. The Prince Studio. I remember coming down to an art crawl, probably 2005. All of a sudden, you walked down the street and there's just these bright lights. So it just felt like, you know, the eyes of the ballads had, had popped on all of these shops. And there was this, like, live music coming out from all, like, the little art galleries, little vendors here and there. You kind of knew everybody on the street. I just love that small town feel to it. I ran into a buddy of mine just in the middle of James Street during Super Crawl. He sees me and goes, what happened? Look at all these people. What happened to James Street? Fantastic. Okay, Main Street, Ontario began as the brainchild of Lisa Marie Di Liberto and Charles Ketchabaugh. They are the artistic director and managing director of Fixed Point, a nonprofit theater and media company. And we are delighted to welcome the two of you to TVO tonight. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having Ken, us. Ken, just before we talk about uh, the show that you're performing and we get into more detail on these uh, items that you've done here, let's just talk a bit about your background. You're from The Hammer. I am, yeah. yes. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Ancaster. And went to school where? Westdale. Oh, very nice, yes. very nice. Um, what's, what, I mean, what was the childhood like? Well, you know, I grew up in, a, in Ancaster when it was a village. It was a really small mm -hmm. town. It was pretty cozy and quaint. It's all part of the super city of Hamilton now, but... Yeah, that's yeah, right. Back in and the day, it wasn't. Back in the day, it was like that. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of the inspiration for the project, the kind of main street and downtown that we had there in Ancaster when I was growing up. Charles, where are you from? The Big Cheese, Ingersoll, Ontario. <laughs> the Big Cheese. Okay. And your background? What was that like? Uh, well, I grew up uh, not too far off of Main Street, which was Thames Street in Ingersoll. And uh, I walked up and down that street to school, to public school. And then I walked up and down that street to high school every day. And I remember it fondly. It's, it's changed, but it has definitely stayed the same. One of the, uh, we should point out here, you two not only work together, but you, you are together. You are a couple, <laughs> yes. right? Very much so, yes. Yeah. I don't know if we'll have time to get into the uh, oddities of trying to work and be a family <laughs> together, but that might be for another opportunity. But, but I presume, you know, Ancaster, Ingersoll, two smallish places. Was that part of, Charles, what uh, you two thought you had in common? I don't know. Uh, initially, I don't think so. I think we just sort of fell in love with each other Aww. quite quickly uh, and then uh, went our separate ways for a few years and then realized that we couldn't live without each other. So we decided to start a company and dedicate our lives to each other and work. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of nice the way he put That's that. That's very nice. Yeah, isn't that sweet? That's very would nice. Would you have said something as sweetly about him? Oh, absolutely. You would. Okay, yeah, just absolutely. confirming that. And you not only created a company, you've created a family now too, right? That's right. Yeah. We have two little sons, two years old and four years old. Our four, my four-year-old asked me to wear this bow tie 
this morning. Very sharp. You knew I was going to be on your show. Uh, it's a serious so, show requiring a serious yeah, look. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so. I'm very serious. I can so. tell. I can tell that. So let's sort of set the scene here. You, you are a traveling road show. You are driving across the country. You would arrive in a town. You've got these two kids in tow. Pick up the story. How did you, I mean, how, how does this possibly work? Well, the first place I think we, we, we piloted the project and tried it and developed it here in Toronto and in Ontario. But when we hit the road, the first place we went to was Parsborough. Where's that? In Nova Scotia. And we pulled up, uh, I think, to a church. We always tried to find places where we saw a few people when we very first started. Uh, and we pulled up the Storymobile to there, and one person came, and then another person came. And then all of a sudden, we were surrounded by people who wanted to talk about their town. Um, but it's not always that easy. Sometimes uh, you find yourself, like in Spring Hill, uh, Nova Scotia, where it's hard to get people to come in and talk. And Lisa has this great technique where she will be on the uh, sidewalk. And if anybody comes within, I don't know, uh, earshot, she's like, oh my gosh, thanks for coming. That's so great that you made it. Uh, and of course, they can't say no to her. So, um, as you could, into the story of Mobile, <laughs> as I couldn't, I can relate, I understand. <laughs> Charles, now we saw from the technique by which you tell your stories, there's, mm -hmm. th there's not a ton of actual live footage. You mm -hmm. do a lot of production work, you use old still pictures, you, you sort of mm -hmm. created those funny caricatures of, of the participants in the story. So how, how, how and where do you do all of that work? I presume you're not doing it in the field as you go along. No, we do all the interviewing in the field. Um, and then we, for the series that we produced uh, with TVO, we would work with local archives, uh, museums, and things like that to try to bring some of their stuff to life. A lot of people have beautiful shoebox memory collections mm -hmm. that aren't documented anywhere, which is something that we're really, I think that excites us both very much as kind of the extraordinary of the ordinary. And, and so you, you sort of put out feelers like anything uh, and you find these bits and pieces and we work with some very skilled animators and technicians mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, uh, and musicians. And, and then we kind of start to, we sort of look at everything that we have and we start to craft a bit of a story and an arc and, and then you start to pull in these pieces and put it together. And you've, Lisa Marie, been at this for how long now? Well, the first Tale of a Town happened in our storefront studio in 2008 on Queen Street West. And it was just an idea. It was actually inspired by Ancaster and that small town, that mm. village, and sort of the erosion of that and the kind of coming of the big box stores. And so I was just exploring that idea. I remember it was the first Toronto Arts Council grant that I ever got. Mm. And then that's when Charles and I were sort of coming together. And his expertise is in interviewing and radio documentary and all that kind of kind of technical work and, and the human voice and mine in theater and clowning. So as we sort of came together, we started to interview people and then use the interview material to create different plays. Hmm. So now but you have, you've not been at this for 10 years oh yeah, straight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So 2008, we did the first play in the storefront and then we remounted that show in in Queen West in our storefront. That's when um, Theatre Passamurai is a theatre here in Toronto. Oh, yes. Andy McKim, he saw the work and he invited us to do the project in Queen West, which was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a launching point for us. That's when sort of different people became interested. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, in collaboration with the National Arts Centre of Canada, we launched the National Project. Mm -hmm. So from 2014 to 2016, we toured to every province and territory in Canada interviewing people and creating plays in collaboration with local professional artists inspired by the interviews. So we would go to a community, conduct a range of interviews or around the province, then go to the capital or where a presenting partner is, listen to all those interviews with local professional artists, and then create a performance piece. And then invite the community back to come and see that production and where their voice sits in. So you've been living out of a suitcase for three or four years Yeah, now? yeah, yeah. We, we, well, we, we live out of the suitcase sort of in the summer months, sort of May to October. Mm -hmm. And then we plan all the rest of the winter, plan, write funding applications, sort of get our presenting partners, line everything up, and then we go back out on the road. Hmm. I don't know about Ingersoll, because I just haven't been there enough, but Ancaster, mm -hmm. I, I have been to a lot. And mm -hmm. of course, I, first four years of my life, I lived there. Yeah. 
And uh, I'm kind of curious as to, you know, this is about Main Street Canada, Main Street Ontario, mm -hmm. your series. Mm -hmm. Ancaster is nothing like what it was when, when I lived there. It's kind of a rich suburb of Hamilton yeah. now in many ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what are your thoughts about how it has transformed itself over the years? Well, you know, for me, I really miss the village and the small town yeah. feeling. And I yeah. think that's a feeling that many people share across the country about their small town. You know, mm -hmm. on Main Streets, at, at one point when we started this project, we thought, well, maybe we would be able to bring Main Streets back again, that people would be so inspired when they heard all these stories. But, you know, Things always keep changing and developing. So I don't think Ancaster is ever going to be the same as it was back in the day. Mm -hmm. But what the project has been successful in doing is capturing the memories of that time and recording those, creating an oral history um, of every day, as Charles said, sort of those everyday ordinary stories that made up a, a time when main streets and downtowns were really the place to be. Why is that important to do, Charles? Um... I think it's important to capture memories of all types uh, for us to be able to go back to in the future and hopefully garner some inspiration from. For me, I just love the human voice. Like, I just can't, I just love to listen to people, uh, whether it's talk radio or, or, you know, like I'm a huge Studs Terkel. <laughs> fan, so just even reading uh, the 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 word, the human, but the human voice, you can hear so it's so much more than just the words being spoken. You can glean from it, and I'd like to believe that uh, capturing voices that aren't normally represented, and I think that's sort of the next big push of this project is is important because those voices eventually disappear, and. It's better than a recountment. I think it's better to hear the people themselves. You, you, you're really into the people's history in that respect, as opposed to sort of, you know, here's what politically was happening, here's what the big businesses in town were doing. You want to hear from the folks. Yeah, because I, I think you get all that after you interview a group of people, a number of people from a place, uh, you, you sort of get what was happening, and, and, uh, but it's not so on the nose, and, and it's a little bit more poetic, I guess, hmm. uh, when you derive multiple voices and you put them together and, and you hear sort of this collective community memory. Now, because we all love history, and, and these pieces, I have to tell you, are very nostalgic, obviously. I mean, when those old pictures really, hmm. uh, I'm going to say, bring it to life, uh, even though you're talking about stuff that in some cases is, you know, 80, 90 years old. Any concern that you are overly romanticizing a past that wasn't actually that way? Well, absolutely. I mean, that's something we sort of started to think about as we went through the project. Mm -hmm. Like, at the beginning, we were, you know, everyone was, we had all these nostalgic memories of main streets and downtowns. But then as we got a little more confident and we developed our capacity a little bit more, we had more artists working with us and a little bit more time and resources, we were able to look a little deeper and see, you know, what are the aspects of main street that aren't so amazing? What are mm -hmm. the memories that people who wasn't included on main streets and downtowns I mean, in you Canada. did that for the Hamilton piece where you've yeah. got lots of lots of those great old stores being uh -huh. boarded up now uh -huh. and the downtown uh -huh. you know pretty close to the, dying at one point mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's coming back now but still mm -hmm. the okay. decline also the and decline. We, there's a lot to learn from that too like what happened yeah. like what if we really miss all these places then and we want to keep these places then we have to frequent these places we have to be there you know that's where we have to kind of spend our money and our time if we want those places to stay. And, and that's something I think to myself all the time. It's easy to go to a big box store or to a mall or, mm -hmm. you know, but what, what is it that we get from going to somewhere that's more local, where we know the person behind the counter, where, you know, a place where you can leave your key, a place like that was our neighborhood in Parkdale, where we did start this project in Parkdale, Toronto. You know, there was this amazing block of stores where we knew everybody on the block and sort of... So as we moved there and started to develop this idea, we thought, like, this is amazing. Right here in this huge city of Toronto, there's these small little towns, these little communities with their own main street. And we should celebrate those. And if we can continue to celebrate those and remind people how amazing these places are and have been in the past or are right now, then we can encourage people to keep them alive. I, I know every town has its own unique stories, obviously. But I wonder, as you went to town after town after town after town, 
whether there was also a sameness about the experience that a lot of these towns had, you know? Like there's the movie theater, that's not a movie theater anymore, and you know, here's the Woolworths, which of course, uh, you know, mm -hmm. boarded up years ago. I don't know, does it have that feel to it as well? Uh, bingo, like, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's lots of those uh, across the country. Uh, Lisa and I used to sort of uh, jokingly say, as some people would come up, we'd be like, I'll bet you that it was 15 cents to go to the movie, or I bet you it was a dollar. Uh, but they're, they're different and they're the same. I mean, there's, we, we think of the chains uh, that we're aware of, of like big box stores, uh, but there were chains across the country, cinemas and, and you know, Zellers and Kresge's and Woolworths, those all occupied the downtown at one point, and those replaced independent shops, you know? Um, but just a personal question for you mm. here. How, how do you not get <laughs> bored hearing, you know, oh, this same thing happened to yet another small town in yet another province, and I've heard this same phenomenon now 30 times in a row. How do you keep it fresh? The characters. Okay. And I would say, I, I, for me, it, it's because you do hear the same thing over and over again, but you have to remember that it means so much personally to each person, but it's the characters. In one of the episodes of our series, uh, there's a lady, Louise Cook, who um, ran a movie theater in Prince Edward County, and there's individual characters that still inhabit all of our downtowns and main streets across this country that are so unique. Uh, even though they're similar, like they're kind of the same, uh, characteristics of these characters across the country, they're what really bring the downtowns to life. So when you hear about those people, you're reminded that there is, like, the individual still reigns supreme in people's memory. And let's just understand as well the two different aspects of what you're up to here. We saw at the beginning of our chat, you've got the sort of two, three minute documentary piece, the video that, mm -hmm. that has aired on TVO, for example, and is online. Uh, but there's the performance aspect of the tour as well. What are you actually doing then? What are we doing? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, so after we did this tour across the country, mm -hmm. this national tour gathering stories, we call that our story gathering tour. We made kind of site-specific performances for that. We took all of that and we created a play, a national sort of culminating production. And that's what we're touring right now. And this is now touring to theaters across Canada. This is a show that tells the tale of Canada's main streets, and it features voices from every province and territory in one production. So if people go to this, what is mm -hmm. it exactly they're seeing? They're seeing, a, they'll, they'll basically be taking a trip with us and our two kids across the country. They see our story mobile. It's actually all in miniature. Charles is on stage with a live feed video camera, and he's sort of filming these miniature sets that I'm performing and he's performing, and you'll hear audio from, all the way from Cape Dorset and Nunavut, uh, from Georgetown and Prince Edward Island, a 104-year-old woman we interviewed. Um, <laughs> there's, so there's, and, and it also tells sort of that journey of ours over three years that we took across the country. So people will follow that story across the country with us. And it's, they follow it through people's own sort of voices and stories, but of course we've curated that and put it together mm -hmm. to also tell our own story mm -hmm. of our family and our adventure. Yes. How do you cross the entire country with, a couple of little tots like that. How does that work exactly? You start on the East Coast for sure, and then you move west. And as you move west, you have another child, and you get a four-door Jeep. You, you, so you had to get rid of the old vehicle and, and move up a bit? Well, the, the two-door Jeep now uh, is with another team that, that doesn't have children, and they, they tour around with another story. Mobile. I see, okay. Yeah. I was just telling Zevon this morning, we were getting into that red Jeep, we still have it, that we used to put him in through the trunk because you know when they're really little they're facing backwards mm -hmm. so we'd have to kind of we'd open the jeep and like pull it up and then pull out this baby out of the trunk and people would be like oh <laughs> but that's because it was a two door right so it's easy yeah yeah it. yeah yeah but you know it was just it was something we wanted to do and now that they're getting bigger actually they're a little bit more they want more they want to do more things they're in school and daycare but when they were really little and babies they they were sort of portable and they just kind of came along and sometimes that is what drew people into our story mobile. Did you get to every province and territory? We did, yeah. yeah. Every single one? Yeah, every you single one. You went to Inuvik, right? Uh, no, we didn't go there. We no. went to uh, Yellowknife, though. Huh. Yep. Yeah, we went to Yellowknife. Um, and? 
I was amazing. Well, actually, funny part of the story is when I had the second baby, Charles went to a couple of the places on his own. And it was actually a big, it was a big sort of crisis. We thought, what are we going to do? We're supposed to tour the whole province, the whole country, every province and territory together. That's part of our project. We have this timeline. We want to finish 2014 to 2016. But of course, I had the two-year-old and the baby. So we said, well, that's just going to be part of the story. And so, in fact, Charles went to Yellowknife on his own and to mm -hmm. Prince George, BC on his own. And we thought, oh, what are we going to say, like, in the show? And But in the show, we just, that's part of the show. Part the, of the show. The baby yeah. is born. I stay home. <laughs> he goes off and, you know. Mm -hmm. Charles even says in there, I don't know who had it harder, Charles doing the project without me, so because he was making these shows and you know taking sort of both hats, or me at home with a newborn baby and a two-year-old, but... And missing being out there. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. But you know, eventually, uh, when he came back from Yellowknife, we decided we'd get back in the saddle, and then the four of us, so us and Charles and I and the two little babies, two and pretty much newborn, drove mm -hmm. from Toronto to Whitehorse. And then... How long did that take? That took, uh, what, 12 days? It was over yeah. 6,000 kilometers. My goodness. So that was kind of crazy. Had you been to the north before? Uh, no. Well, well, no. I mean, I'd been to Yellowknife. Which okay, is well, that's the north. north. Yeah. But Im impressions? Other... It's, a diff it's a different place. I mean, we discovered driving through Canada, you know, the f very north. When you get even into the prairies into the north, it's a different country than what we're used to in Ontario and even the East Coast. Uh, and it's not always, I mean, it's pretty, beautiful, but but it's also somewhat heart-wrenching sometimes when you see the way uh, some people have are living in our very own country. It's, it's totally changed my perspective of what Canada is. I mean, never mind that you two are both from Ontario. You're both from Southern Ontario. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've really in your backgrounds only lived a very narrow slice of what this country has to offer. Mm -hmm. And you got to some astonishing places that you'd never been before, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. What was your thought when you first got to the north and you looked around, what'd you think? Well, it's just so eye-opening how different it is and the, the, the amount of, of history or, 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 you know, the, just the way that things are set up. Like when we got off, we took a ship through Nunavut uh, with Adventure Canada, they invited us to go on an expedition cruise with them. And so when we would get off in each place, we would interview people. And getting off in a place like Cape Dorset, I mean, it's just, I mean, there was all dirt roads. We were trying to find Main Street, and there was no street signs, you know? We were, like, meeting people down. And there was still a general store where people would meet. But the, the stories, you know, to connect the stories from Cape Dorset to the ones in southern Ontario, it was, it was interesting and sometimes difficult to find that link. Um, I, I heard this awesome story when we were in Nunavut about uh, the night the Cape Dorset pool hall closed down. And it was actually in that pool hall they discovered this big piece of slate. And because they use all the materials there because it's such a remote community. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to figure out what to do with the, the pool table. They had kind of cleared the place out. And, and then actually they decided they'd use that slate they try to use it for the printmaking of the artist co-op because that's where the West Baffin Artist Inuit Co-op is. Hmm. And so they brought this slate over and they started carving into it and rolled the paint on and it worked so well. <laughs> so it was because of this closed down pool table that they ended up discovering this, this slate material to use for the printmaking. And it ramped up production so much so that they became world renowned for this kind of Inuit art. Hmm. So that was a really interesting story to hear. And you know, it, it, it sort of sparked me because of the connection that it has to that place, but also to these kind of main street stories that we were hearing. I would find it hard to believe that at some point in your travels, you didn't make a kind of a top five list of some sort. Hmm. Here are our favorite places. Wow. Did you do that? Um, I have favorite places. I don't have, I don't think I have like favorite stories, but definitely I have some favorite places. Shoot, for what's sure. on your list? Uh, Moose Jaw was pretty tremendous. Um, I, I, what, what made Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan <laughs> tremendous? Well, their, uh, their downtown is, is probably one of the most preserved, uh, downtowns, uh, and as, uh, they say it's because they were so uh, out of cash that they couldn't tear anything down. Uh, and um, I'm trying to think. I like uh, that we stayed in with Summerside PEI, which is nothing spectacular other than the time that we had there was great. Uh, you know and what it's known for, right? 
the Canada Revenue? Yes. Yes. The GST. <laughs> yes. Well, when you get them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, that's, right. <laughs> that's not why you loved it, obviously. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Yes. Um, you know, all throughout Manitoba was really fascinating. Churchill was totally eye-opening. Mm -hmm. um, Fort McMurray was uh, something that I was really looking forward to, and I certainly wasn't disappointed. And we had we went before um, the tragic before the fire fire that occurred there, and I interviewed employee number three of the the, the very first um, mi mining oil setup there. <laughs> That was cool. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. that's a good list. Lisa Marie, what's on I your could list? I go on. Oh, gee. It's so, I mean, I fall in love with almost every place when we get there, truly, and the people, because, you know, you're sitting nah, there trying to. That's, that's you know, a cop out. Forget but, it. But, okay, Flin Flon, Manitoba, <laughs> really right. interesting place. So much music. Um, and I found out why, because I guess when they used to interview people to work in the uh, mine there, they would ask people if they were musical. And if they were musical, then they would get the job over someone else with the exact same credentials because they wanted to build this community. It was a planned community, like a company town. We, we ran into a lot of those kind of company towns yeah. as we toured around, which were kind of built around the company. So this Main Street was set up almost, you know, so I, idyllic, like this Main Street with all these like different little shops. And, and then, of course, behind, we heard a lot of stories about behind these shops, there'd be all these like, gambling kind of setups or different kind of things like behind the curtain, which were exciting. Hmm. You know, if you were a tenor and you interviewed for a job in Flin Flon, you would get all the day shifts at, because <laughs> they would want you to sing in the choir and be there. And, and just to this day, like so many musicians came into the Storymobile to play songs uh, about Flin Flon that they had written. And it's, so it's such a musical place, but because of kind of this this fostering of a musical community. So that was a really That's interesting place. Yeah. Who's the most famous person to come from Flin Flon, Manitoba? Oh, we did interview them. <laughs> I don't know. Who Bobby is? Clark. Okay, okay. Former yeah, captain yeah, of the right. Philadelphia yeah, okay, Flyers. Yeah. It's funny you say that because one of the gentlemen that you did interview yeah. talked about playing with Bobby Clark. Oh, yeah, that's like right. Yeah. Kind of every other sentence. Yeah, hmm. that's right. Well, Given that you went out and fanned across the whole country, every mm -hmm. province and territory, and collected, no doubt, a treasure trove of content. How do you possibly decide what you're going to put in and what you're going to leave out? How do you even start to figure that out? Well, I see you're shaking your heads. So I know it's such a, it's I mean, it's an impossible it task in some it, respects. It, it depends on each kind of, you know, for the local pieces, we're, we're looking for story threads. So things like Charles mentioned, the collective community memory. So if a lot of people are talking about a certain place or a certain character or a certain moment in time that's happened in their downtown that's in their living memory of course that's also a big point we always interview people about what they can remember in their own lifetime so not like what they bring forward in their history books but what they can remember in their own life so as we sort of look at the collection of stories that people are oh i really remember this place or this person and those become the the things that we include and then that's in the local productions and then in this national production it was sort of looking at all the different Main Street themes that we sort of discovered and choosing almost a province and a territory in which to situate each one of those themes. So, you know, one sort of province, we cover movie theaters and we might focus in on a movie theater, the movie theaters in Regina, Saskatchewan that were there. And then as we're in that scene, we'll hear audio from other places about their movie theaters, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a kind of a culling process. It's hard to, it's hard to decide. But we also have a story map online where we take all the individual interviews and edit sort of like the best 30 seconds, one minute piece and mm -hmm. tag those online. So we're able to find different ways to posit the interviews. I mean, each interview has mm -hmm. something really, usually has something really awesome. Yeah, I was gonna say the hard part is, um listening to the interviews like a year or two years later and realizing how great it is hmm. and but at the time maybe you didn't and but you listen to it back and you're like oh my goodness this is so good or somebody else has done the interview and you're just listening to it to, to do like a paper edit and a log and you're like oh my goodness this is so great but the person who did the interview maybe didn't catch it and so i feel like it's sort of going to be uh doing this forever it just so that is the plan to keep going i i think so yeah i mean i don't know if it's always going to be about towns uh but i think as far as talking to 
people, everyday people, about everyday things that matter to them. I, I, to me, there's nothing better to do with your time. Because you've got the shorts, you've got the stage production. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, when I saw your stuff, I thought to myself, well, there's a book here, there's a two-hour documentary here as well. I mean, any plans to expand this? I think we'd, we'd like to see how far we can take it. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that we both enjoy doing now is, is uh, training people to go out and do this work. Because mm -hmm. uh, you spent the better part of like five years now sort of figuring out every possible thing you could do wrong. And, <laughs> and we've done them. Uh, okay. and, and so... But it, great wisdom to come from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to think so. So, that I mean, for us, it's it's great when you train somebody and then they go take the skills that they learn and apply it to their own interests. And Well, if people want to see what you've been up to for the last, uh, however you count it, three, four, ten years of your life, <laughs> Let's, um, shall we put this up here, Sheldon? Here are your upcoming tour dates. You're at the Milton Center for the Arts on the 20th of January. People want to celebrate the first anniversary of Donald Trump's uh, ascension to the presidency. They can do it in Milton that day. Uh, the first Ontario Performing Arts Center is January 25. That's in St. Catharines, 25 to 27. The Kingston Grand, which is a gorgeous old theater, uh, three and a half hours east of here. Uh, January 30th to February 4th, and then you're coming right back down here to Southern Ontario at the Burlington Performing Arts Center for February 8th to 10th. That's what you've got for now. Plans, though, beyond that? Keep yeah. her going? Yes, keep it going. Well, there's no lack of interest. You know, a lot of people, a lot of towns are still getting in touch with us. We, we didn't go to every single town and every <laughs> single main street in right. Canada, right? So there's so many places that still have stories to share or, you know, a living memory that they want to document. So we're hoping that we can respond to all of that and send, and sometimes it's not us, sometimes we send out teams of artists, like Charles mentioned, that we train and they're gonna go out and gather those stories. There's plans, you know, to make other shows. So, you know, actually we started with a show called The Tale of a T-Shirt, and then we were gonna do The Tale of a Town and then The Tale of a Tomato. <laughs> but, you know, we just kind of got stuck on Tale of a Town, so I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get to this show, The Tale of a Tomato, about the origin of food. More to come. Um, yeah, lots of interviewing people about different aspects that main streets is one sort of deep exploration but there are other sort of subjects that we can kind of deeply investigate through or oral history and performance great uh we thank you so much for coming in tonight and sharing your views on all of this uh we should say two more things number one i love that you went to manitoulin island because that is an absolutely you know gem of a of a secret in the province mm -hmm. of ontario mm -hmm. and um tell the kid the bow tie was a good choice too yeah Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for encouraging me, Steve. Well done, I appreciate Ziba. Okay, it. good. <laughs> that's Lisa Marie Diliberto and Charles Ketchabaugh. Fixed Point, that's F-I-X-T, Point, is the name of their theater company. Thanks so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.